Let's get started. You ready to do some work? If I had to define worship in one word, if I had to define worship for you in one word, and there are many ways to define worship, but if I had to define worship in one word, not one sentence, not one phrase, not one, just one word, if I had to define it to you in one word, that word would be a word that many of us possibly don't think about when we think about worship. It'd be a word that we possibly don't associate with worship at all. It'd be a word that we possibly wouldn't like to hear or think about or be challenged with. It's a word that we possibly won't enjoy because it's not popular in our generation or in our culture either. It's not that popular. It's popular with some demographics or some groups of people like entrepreneurs, people that like to grind. But if I had to define worship in one word, the one word that I would choose to define worship would be sacrifice. Sacrifice is the one word that I would use for us to understand the essence of what God is looking for when we worship him. There are many ways to worship. There are many forms and shapes and sizes. There are many different practices when it comes to worship. But at the essence of what God is actually looking for in us, his church, those of us that profess to follow Jesus, those of us that profess to live as followers of Christ, the one way that God is hoping for and expecting for us to worship him is through that one word. Say it with me, sacrifice. Now we all worship one way or another. We worship different things. We worship different people. We worship different careers. We worship different styles. We have different forms of worship. Sometimes our worship is through our time. Sometimes our worship is where our money goes. Sometimes our worship is who we actually sacrifice for. But when you are a worshiper of Jesus, any worshipers of Jesus in the house? When you are a worshiper of Jesus, one of the best things that we could do is worship God and love God his way. Can you say his way? His way. Not my way. Yeah, God's way. And God defines to us what worship he wants. And he uses the same exact definition that I just gave you. There's a popular verse that you all know about, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him god defines worship as sacrifice now, sacrifice could be an annoying word it's attractive when we think of the concept it's attractive when we want to put it as a virtue that we live by it's attractive to those that love hashtag the grind and the hustle yeah, we're sacrificial and we know it and it feels good to put it on social media. But it's not attractive when it comes to the moment where we have to step up to the plate and God is saying, I want sacrifice from you in this area of your life. It's not comfortable when God is asking for sacrifice in an area that you want to preserve and love and you want to protect. It's, 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 it's not attractive, the word sacrifice, when what God is asking you to do is to leave your comfort zone. We don't like it there. It's, it's, it's not attractive when we're tired and exhausted and we don't feel good. And God is saying, I want you to keep on serving. I want you to keep on stepping up. I want you to keep on moving. I want you to remain consistent. We don't want to remain consistent in sacrifice when it's uncomfortable. So it's attractive on social media, but it's not attractive in privacy. But God is saying... If you want to worship me, and if we can get the fog, please, to stop, that'd be nice so that I could breathe a little bit better. Thank you. <laughs> God is saying, if you really truly want to worship me, if you truly want to worship me in a way that is pleasing and acceptable before my sight, this one word is going to have to be involved in what you're doing. And that one word is, say it with me, sacrifice. Sacrifice. What makes sacrifice true worship is when you offer something to God that costs you something. When you offer something to God that costs you something. If, you're, if everything that you're offering to God right now in this point is costing you nothing, 
then are you really worshiping him? Because sometimes we have mental constructs, yeah? Where we want to love people our way. Have you seen husbands and wives where they love each other their own way? Like, let me give you an example and I give it to you all the time. The wife's love language is spending quality time. But the husband's love language is acts of service. So he taking the garbage out every day for her, thinking that he's loving her like crazy. It's been 10 years and she... She, and, and even though he takes the garbage out, he doesn't spend one single evening with her out of the week for date night. So he's crushing it in his head going, I'm loving this woman. And she's thinking, why doesn't he love me? And, and, and what was the problem here that he was loving her his way? We sometimes have mental constructs in our definitions of worship to God. Where we want to stay comfortable where we want to do it our way, where we want to offer to him what's easy and what's acceptable, of course. It is acceptable to come to church once a week on a Sunday. Now it's being downgraded, though. Now it's acceptable to only come to church once a week or just one Sunday out of the entire month. And, and it's becoming a cultural trend that, you know, twice a month or once a month, you're all good. That's all God needs. And he's happy when you show up to church on Sunday, sing some cute songs and lift your hands to him and then bounce after the message that only lasted 25 minutes. And we think, okay, I'm doing a good, good, good job and I'm worshiping God. But God is saying, uh-uh. Like if you were to read my thoughts and how do you read God's thoughts? His word. God's word is God's thoughts. And, and, and if the husband were to just get a little bit invested and hear his wife's thoughts, she would realize, he would realize that what she needs is not the garbage being taken out. He would realize that what she needs is one date night a week. Give her a rose, spend some time with her and pay the whole dinner, please, bro. So I'm wondering if what our generation today, I'm wondering is, 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 is what we're giving him costing us something? Like, like, like all of us young people, right? Like, and I'm not talking about money. Please don't think that I'm talking about money, that your worship has to be, like, cost you something. You have to like, empty your life savings out and give it to God and be like, I'm worshiping him, and that's what the pastor said. I'm not talking just about money. <laughs> Although, yes, we do have to give financially, and it has to be something that costs us something. But, but, but I'm talking about your every area of life, every area of your life. It, it, is what you're doing, is what you're offering... Is it costing you something? There's this passage in the Bible of King David where he's coming and he approaches some dude. And this dude recognizes King David in his entourage. And the dude starts bowing down before King David. And the dude says, my king, what are you doing here? And, and King David was coming to that specific land where this dude was living because he wanted to offer God worship. And... We read, and we're going to read it right now, that this guy, this dude, tells King David, I'll give you the land for free and the threshing floor for free so that you can give it to God. And then King David replies something very famous, something very powerful that I believe resonates with the intention and the spirit and the heart of this message. Second Samuel chapter 24 verse 20 says, when Aruna saw the king and his men coming toward him, he came and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Why have you come, my lord of the king? Aruna asked. David replied, I have come to buy your threshing floor and to build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. Take it, my lord of the king, and use it as you wish, Aruna said to David. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and you can use the threshing boards and ox yokes for wood to build the fire on the altar. I will give it all to you, your majesty, and may the Lord your God accept your sacrifice. They understood that worship was tied with sacrifice. But the king replied to Aruna, No, I insist on buying it, for I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, that have cost me nothing. So David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing floor, and the oxen. See, sacrifice is when you offer something, but there may be a risk involved. Wow. Come on. 
Sacrifice is when you freely give value away, but there could be something to lose. Mm -hmm. This is where sacrifice becomes hard for a generation. Yeah. Come on. Because we want security at all times. <laughs> but how could faith work when you're secure all the time? How can you exercise your faith and grow in Christ and see his mighty hand if there is no Red Sea to split? How can we see God's provision when it's all rainbows and butterflies? Huh. See, sacrifice, it's, it's, it's when you choose to create a space of grace for people that could hurt you one day. Yeah. That's sacrifice. Because many people go, how do you do it? How? And by the way, like I look young, but... I am young. Yeah, 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 I am. Yeah, yeah. People go like, you've been doing this for nine years and we've seen some of the struggles. That, like, how do you still keep on going after all the things that some people put you through? And, and here's what I told my team last night. I said, it's because I'm going to live true to my vision statement. I create a space of grace for who? Imperfect people. Pastor... But even the people that hurt you, them too. Yes. They need grace too. Yeah. Oh, but isn't that hard? Hell yeah. I'm, I'm this close. <laughs> oh, I'm this close to not doing it. But, 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 but that's costing me something. It's costing me something. It's, 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 it's what we call sacrifice. Sacrifice. All of this is part of sacrifice. And true sacrifice is always based off one four-letter word. Starts with L, ends with E. You say it on three. One, two, three. Love. <laughs> Worship is sacrifice. And sacrifice is derived from love. For God so loved the world that he sacrificed his only begotten son. See? You, you, you think the cross was easy for Jesus? Do you remember the prayer that Jesus made before he was going to go to the cross and before they were going to kill him, humiliate him, malnourish him, beat him, mock him, spit on him? He was telling God, he's God the Father, if there's another way for you to do this, spare me this cup of suffering. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. I don't necessarily want to create a space of people that have hurt me or that will hurt me. I don't know. In the future, it's going to happen no matter what. Anytime that you are in a relationship with imperfect people, friction's bound to happen. I don't want to create a space that's hard for me. But what kind of worship would I be giving to the Lord if it didn't cost me anything? I want to be like King David, that I'm not going to give to God something that costs me nothing. I want it to cost me something because I believe he's worth it. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. I don't want to be pressured into it. I don't want to feel forced to do it. I want to do it out of my heart because I believe. I believe with all my heart that God deserves the best. He deserves all that I've got. See, a lot of you want to get married and you're happy to get married and you're so excited about getting married and you're really, really honestly frustrated because you're still single and you just can't wait till you meet the one and da 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 and you really want to be married. Don't you know what marriage is? It's anonymous to sacrifice. People that are married are like, I wish I was single. I wish I was single. Someone say true story. Yeah, nothing that you guys know about. No, for real, like marriage is sacrificial. Especially when marriage becomes something very difficult where maybe one of you, not you, sorry, one of the people in the marriage gets sick and they can't function physically anymore. Now the husband has to take care of the wife or the wife has to now take care of the husband and it's sacrifice. See, sacrifice is based off love. And, and God wants us to love him and, and love, love and worship. They're tied to, say it with me, sacrifice. Now, one of the things that will always want to attack a sacrificial heart is a four-letter word. I hate it. I hate this word. One of the things that will always want to attack a sacrificial heart is fear. Uh, come on. 
fear. Fear knows that a sacrificial heart can change the world. Fear knows that a sacrificial heart can transform the world upside down. Fear knows what a sacrificial heart can do. Fear knows that if it can get you to place comfort over your calling, emotion over your mission, or selfishness over sacrifice, your impact in the world will go to the grave with you in seed form, fruitless. How many people have potential? How many people have gifting? How many of you in the back have calling? Hey. <laughs> Am I in the wrong church, God? Like, honestly. Should we try that again? How many people in the back know that they have a calling? There you go. Yeah. Not bad, not bad, okay. How many people on this side know that you have a calling from God? All right, right side. You want to take that from the left? How many people here in this side know that you have a calling from God? All right, middle. Wait, wait. See, they're so loud they already started. Okay, all right, you guys ready? How many of you here in the front middle know that you have a calling from God in your life? Shall we do it all together? How many people in this theater in Vancouver City know that they have a calling from God in their life? All right, settle down. Now here's the thing. Fear knows. Fear knows. Fear knows. Fear knows that it knows that if you have a calling, that if you have a calling over your life, if you've been placed with a mantle here on earth to do something to change the world, fear knows that if you've been called by God to change it, it's going to want to take your impact and take you to the grave with your impact in seed form. Seed form. The grave is the richest place on earth. So many businesses, so many empires that never got to be seen and built are in the grave. So many books that were supposed to be authored and written are in the grave. So many powerful movies that Christians could have made into something nice. Unfortunately, they're in the grave. So many power couples. So many amazing pastors, evangelists, leaders in the hands of the living God are in the grave in seed form. Seed form means fruitless. Fear knows this. Fear knows and believes in what you carry more than you believe it yourself. Fear knows. We live in an anxious generation. Anxiety is a stronghold that we have to slap in the face and kick it out of here. I've heard testimonies of people so anxious they can't touch the the doorknob of their home to to, to get out and leave. Oh man. That's, 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 That's a captive. And only the name of Jesus has the power to break that. Only the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of Kings, the name above all names. And so we're so fearful in this generation. And so fear knows that if it can poison you and infect your mind, he knows that you'll never sacrifice. Fear wants to remove your level of sacrifice. Because fear knows that your sacrifice can change the world. Look at the 12 men that Jesus chose. Bro, they flipped the world upside down. And let me tell you, there were two great powers against them. The religious leaders with the temple and the Roman Empire against 12 men. And they were not educated. They didn't go to seminary. 
if you catch my flow, you know. If you know, you know. They, they, they didn't go to some special training, boot camp or inside elevation. But they were with Jesus. And now we call our kids John and Paul and we call our dogs Nero. <laughs> who would have thought, right? Okay. Now, if you don't know who Nero was and you gotta do some history. That's incredible to me. <laughs> that was my mom's laugh, by the way. She's so cute. Come on, can we get up for this woman? <laughs> this woman raised me. She taught me. She shaped me, along with my dad. My dad's in the back over there, all the way over there. Yeah, you won't see him. He's all the way in the back, guarding the door. He's like, I ain't letting no criminal come here. Like, Shh. And by criminal, I mean no anxious spirit, no fear spirit. He's guarding the gate. So fear knows, fear knows. And I wonder how many times Paul, Peter, John, had to face fear and confront it so that their sacrifice could change you. They never even met you, but they changed you. They never spoke to you, but they touched your heart and they all sacrificed their lives. See, fear knows that. Fear knows that if you can get, if it can get you to a place of comfort, your impact in the world will go to the grave, but in seed form. One of the shoulders that life-changing impact stands on is sacrifice. And fear knows that. That's why it's been shouting whispers of anxiety and insecurity, depression, even worthlessness and worry to this generation. Yeah. Think about that. Anxiety, insecurity, depression, worthlessness, suicide, and worry are the voices that are whispering shouts to our generation right now. Why? Because it wants to cripple a life of sacrificial worship so that no lives can be changed in our world. Wow. This was the very same challenge a young woman named Esther in the Bible had to face. Yeah. Esther was a young woman. And Esther was a Jew. And she was living in a time of a Persian king. And the Persian king got pissed off at his wife for some reason. So he divorced his wife. And he's like, I got an idea. I'm going to make a beauty pageant to find a new wife. Imagine that, eh? <laughs> so he's like, find all the most beautiful virgins in all of my kingdom. Bring them to me. So this Persian king decides to make a contest. <laughs> so bad, right? Dude, the Bible would actually make a good Netflix TV show. I'm not lying. <laughs> Whoever thinks the Bible's boring, you haven't read it. And so, um, Mordecai is Esther's uncle. And he enters Esther into the contest. But Mordecai tells Esther, just don't tell him that you're a Jew. And so she ends up winning the contest, this little Jewish girl named Esther. Now, um, kings and queens had a really odd relationship. They weren't like us, you know, where we can go on dates together and post pictures together. No, she, she can only talk to him if, if he asked her to come. That was it. A very, very key, key thing to, to, to consider in this story, okay? Um, so there's this guy called Haman, lame Haman. He sucked. <laughs> Haman hated the people of God, and he wanted to kill all the Jews. And the reason why he got into so much hatred towards uh, the Jews was because Esther's uncle, what's his name? Mordecai. Mordecai was chilling one day, mm -hmm. and Haman was a drunk and got drunk, and Haman was the right hand of the king. So everywhere Haman went, people would bow down to Haman. And so one day, Haman gets drunk, and he sees Mordecai chilling, and he's like, hey, all you bow, bow, bow to me. And then you know, Mordecai's chilling over there and he's like, hey, why aren't you bowing down to me, huh? And then Mordecai said, because I only bend my knee to God. Your faithfulness to God 
will sometimes cause conflict in your life. I'm not lying. So if you're not a sacrificial Christian, you're going to run at the sign of conflict. That's why it's important for you to understand that you need sacrifice. Say it on three, one, two, three. Sacrifice. So Haman got pissed or mad. Sorry, pardon my language. I'm so sorry. Hey, this is a space of grace for me too, okay? <laughs> Nervous laughter. <laughs> Haman gets mad because this Jew called Mordecai did not bow down to him because the Jews have their own God to worship. Mm -hmm. So Haman talks to the king and convinces him, let's have a decree to kill all these people, the Jews, and let's roll the dice to pick the day. And so they chose the day and it was decreed that on this day, all the Jews we're going to get killed by law. And how did the king end up agreeing to this? The king was a drunk too. So the two drunk people put together, no good. All right. So yeah, be careful when you go on dates and you're both getting drunk. It doesn't lead to good things. No, for real, true story. Y'all know some of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's too early for don't play games. <laughs> So, so, so Haman uh, convinces the king and the king to create it, but the king has no clue that his beautiful wife is a Jew. Mm. Wow. And Mordecai had saved the king's life one day, which was a crazy because Mordecai overheard that they were going to kill the king. So Mordecai reported it to Esther and Esther reported it to the king. And so Mordecai was on the king's good side. Yeah. And one day, uh, one night, like I think like a couple nights before, the decree was set for them to murder all the Jews. The, the king is drunk, chilling, and he remembers Mordecai for some weird reason. And he gets Haman to ride Mordecai on a royal horse all around the city. <laughs> so God knows how to set a table in the presence of your enemies. So Haman got mad. See, Haman got mad. Haman was a hater. <laughs> hater Haman. Nah. Any haters that you know about in your life? Don't fight them. Let the Lord fight them. If you have no haters in your life, you're not doing anything, okay? It's when you start doing crazy things for God that you'll get Haman haters. Anyways, I can go on a tangent on here, but I won't. Um, to cut the story short, um, Mordecai tells, tells his niece, Esther, the queen, you have to speak to the king. But there's that one problem, y'all remember? You, you can't speak to the king unless he invites you. Because if you come to the king uninvitedly in the Roman, in, in, in the Persian Empire, that was punishable by death. So, here's this moment for this young beauty pageant contestant who barely knows her own Persian king husband has to risk her life and sacrifice. She's young. She's beautiful. She's got her whole life ahead of her. But now she has to sacrifice and risk it. And be afraid to lose it all. So let's pick up the story in Esther chapter 4. Because in this story, there's a famous expression that some of you that have grown up in church possibly know. And I believe that that expression is a prophetic sentence for us today. Esther chapter 4 verse 13 and 14. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther when he was trying to convince her to go talk to the king. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent, if you remain completely silent, I like how you said it silently the first time. <laughs> For if you remain completely silent at this time, say this time, this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. God gives you opportunities to be used by him so that you could be a solution and a vessel of change. God extends opportunities for you to impact the world. 
But when you and I don't take the opportunities, he moves on to the next person. And that's what he's saying. Hey, if you don't do it, God's going to use it. God can use somebody else, Esther. God doesn't need you. God wants to use you, but he doesn't need you. But you and your father's house will perish. Let's try that again. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet you know, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom, read this with me, for such a time as this. And I feel like if I had to pick a title for this sermon, it would be for such a time as this. We're in a crazy season. Come on, if you believe it, put your hands together like you really have faith that God is about to do something special. If you believe that God's going to move mountains, if you believe that God's going to split the Red Sea, if you believe chains are going to fall off, if you believe the Holy Spirit fire is going to inflame and engulf us into passion. Someone shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you've been following us and you've been watching church online, one of the promises that God has given our church, one of the promises that he's confirmed to our church is that next week on October, he's going to begin to move. Come on. Come on. Next week, y'all. Next week, next week, next week. I could already feel it. I could already feel it. And I can feel it because I can feel the devil's attacks. The devil doesn't attack passivity. The devil will not attack a lazy person. Because a lazy person's killing themselves. Read, read Proverbs. Laziness is one of the... Like, it's so bad. Laziness is so bad. It's one of the seven deadly sins. Slothfulness, yes. It's so bad. Like, we, we, we think that, like, sexual sin or murder are the worst, and they are really bad. But murder didn't even make it on the seven deadly sins. Holy... <laughs> laziness did. What? So when the devil's talking, when the devil's going crazy, when the devil's trying to snap your mind in two, you know that God's about to move. All right, let's go back to Esther. Let's go back to Esther. See, Esther, she now had to face her fears. She now had to face anxiety. She now had to risk her life because approaching the king without an official invitation was punishable by death. This was the sacrifice she had to make in order for millions of souls, yes, million, 3.6 or even more, for millions of souls to get saved because death was coming. This was her sacrifice. She had come to the kingdom, and in the words of her uncle, for such a time as this. See, we don't face death threats in our church by a king, a Persian king. But we do face something much worse as a humanity. And that is eternal death. And God has brought you here tonight. If you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus, he has brought you to his kingdom for such a time as this. You were placed in this city. Say Vancouver. At this time, for such a time, as this now the question is will you choose to be faithful to the moment will you choose to be faithful to the now right now oh but I'm, I'm really busy pastor I got a lot to do in my play I have stress at home I have stress in school I got a job to find. Find it, but then come serve. Oh, pastor, but like, like I'm dating somebody right now. How old are you? 17. Oh my God. What sacrifice is God calling you to in this season so that more souls can be saved and changed? That's a good question. What sacrifice is God calling you 
in this season, right now, for one thing, so that more souls could be saved and changed. Yes. Esther had a choice to make. A Esther was facing death, like death in the spot. And, and the, only, the only reason why she would sacrifice, like the, the, the only motive was what? To save souls. Save people's lives. Our faith is built on the eternal, and the truth is that we're all terminal. And, and we're all going to die, all of you. This is why sometimes the drama that comes in life is not worth it. Like stop paying attention to the drama. There are better things, greater things, more important things to talk about, more important things to build on, more important things to invest in. So even if Haman hater, Haman the hater is talking loud, you preach louder. You serve better. You focus. Everybody here has a Haman. And if you don't have one, then you're not doing anything, dude. So we're doing this. Why? It's, 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 it's not so that we can have like a good time, although we do have a good time. Yeah. This is not so that you could be impressed and be like, oh my God, that was so amazing. Although you may be impressed and be like, that was amazing. And yeah, it is amazing. But we have one, we, we were placed here for such a time as this for, right. for one reason. Yeah. And that is that every single soul alive in this place on earth right now will die. And their spirit and their soul, they are eternal. And we will all have to face our maker one day. I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are, how negative you are, how positive you are. Doesn't matter how cool you are, how built you are, how skinny you are. Doesn't matter how anything. It doesn't matter what your background is, how poor you are, or how rich you are. Doesn't matter how tough you may be or how weak you may be. It doesn't matter who the heck you are. It doesn't matter how ugly you are or how good looking you may be. And we got a church full of good looking people tonight, yeah? Yeah? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you're connected to, who you're not connected to. Listen to me. One day, all your connections, all your looks, all your strength, all your stone cold cool faces, they're all gonna drop because your knee's gonna have to bend before Jesus. And the only thing that can save you the only thing that will save you is one thing, and that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. But no one can come to a relationship with Jesus Christ if they don't hear the gospel message. Because you can't place your faith on something you have not heard. But how can people hear if no one tells it? And how can people tell it if no one sends? That's, that's our mission of, as a church. We want more people to hear the message, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, which I'm not preaching today. I'm not preaching that today. And thank God I don't have to preach it every Sunday. Because we have Christians that can preach it in the workplace, in the school place. Yes. Yeah. We're raising a powerful team of believers in Jesus and Crave Church. And the devil is angry. <laughs> the enemy's kicking and screaming right now. I can feel him twitch right now. <laughs> so will you be faithful to now? And are you going to be faithful to what God is calling you to sacrifice in this moment? What, what, what could God be sacrifice, calling you to sacrifice? I don't know. It could be many things. It could be hard for the house. It could be for you to give your time for his cause. Maybe not his, not, maybe not time period, maybe more time. Because maybe you do show up on Sundays. But maybe God is saying, hey, I want you to show up at midweek. Or maybe God has been asking you, I want you to show up for prayer on Wednesdays. So that my kingdom could be advanced. Yeah. Could it be that what he's asking you to sacrifice in this season is for you to forgive someone so he can use you? Or is it to level up and go to the next height of your commitment? What is God asking you to sacrifice? See, it's a life that is offered as a living sacrifice that God can use to change the world. And I want to say that this church is a sacrificial church. If you're here as a guest today, I want you to know that so many people have sacrificed countless of hours for many years in prayer, fasting, serving, preaching, singing, setting up, tearing down. Nine years. 
And during the pandemic, God allowed us to have four campuses here and one campus in Honduras. And we just recently came back from Honduras. And I want to show you a small little video that I pray that impacts you a little bit so that you know that when we're doing How for the House, it's not so the pastor can buy new sneakers <laughs> or spend money on clothes. Holy sheesh. Some people are shameless saying garbage like that. But I've always said, I will never, never have to fight or defend. I'll let the fruitfulness do the talking. Y'all want to see some fruitfulness that happened in Honduras? All right, show them the video, please. A few months ago, we had the opportunity to send out a few of our leaders, including myself, to our very first missions trip in Central America, Honduras. We already have a church functioning there every single week, but one of the crazy things that actually blew my mind was the fact that we have an entire kids church. I told my city group. Um, so basically on the way to Honduras on the plane, I was actually praying to God and I was asking God to change my heart through this trip. And I feel like one of the things that He did was actually change my heart by letting me see the condition of the kids. This is crazy because I, I never shared this with anyone, but um, one of the trips that we had on the way to church in the car, I felt like so much love towards some of the kids that when I saw some of them on the streets, I was actually I actually started crying seeing them. <laughs> and it was funny because everyone was having a good time right beside me. <laughs> and I was crying behind my mask. <laughs> and I was just like, dang, like, wow, like, like God really blessed us to be here, right? Uh, describe uh, what you saw when you were looking outside the, the car window. I just saw, oh my god, why am I crying? This is so funny. <laughs> I just saw, um, I guess, little kids working on the streets trying to sell things. And I just thought about myself. I just thought, dang, like, we have such great opportunities here in Vancouver and in Canada and we don't take advantage of it the same way that these kids do. These kids do, and they're working so hard for a future. And even though they're working so hard for that future, they'll never get the same kind of future that we can get, which is a better opportunity. So I just broke my heart, and I feel like God brought transformation to my heart in that way. And He answered my prayer when I was on the plane, and I asked Him to change my heart. So I kid you not, I actually came back like, I actually feel like I came back changed, so, yeah. What do you want to see in the future of Craig Church and Bears, specifically? Um, I want to see our giving not just to provide for, like, the basic things, but to actually see them um, thank God because of our obedience and our obedience to being generous and for them to to grow up to become you know pastors and leaders through our giving because i i feel like a lot of the times we we give so that we can provide for the basic things like clothes and food but it's so much more than that it's actually eternal right so i want to see them not just thank us but actually thank god 
and Crave Church, let me tell you guys, you guys are, honestly, you're changing people's lives. Who knows, one day these kids could probably grow up to become leaders too. They'll probably grow up to become worship leaders, campus directors, drummers, city group leaders, and all because of your obedience and your generosity. You could be raising a pastor because of your generosity. So I want to encourage each and every single one of you guys to keep on giving because you're giving to an eternal cause, not just a physical cause. Can we put our hands together very nice and loud? The most beautiful thing about when God calls you to sacrifice something is that you end up living such a fulfilled life. You end up living a meaningful life. I'm going to be quick the next couple of seconds with kind of like the battles that I've been facing lately. Um, I've been sharing this this whole week with our church and I find it appropriate to share with you because it relates to the topic and God spoke to me in um, Honduras and he told me in October I'm about to move and I've been saying that for quite a couple of weeks some of our sermons has been recorded da, 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 da. and God has confirmed it to me through powerful ways through his word through people it's just been amazing but with that has come severe attacks of anxiety. And some of the attacks of anxiety that I've been getting, which I've never had before ever in my entire life, I've never, never gone through anxiety, never. I've gone through nervousness and worry, but not anxiety. The attacks of anxiety that have come to my life have spoken and they've said this to me, the higher you rise, Marlon Medina, the harder you're going to fall. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't step into October. The more exposure you get, the more criticism you will hear. The more you let God use you, the more the devil is going to attack you. And I've been hearing this on repeat. And one of the craziest, most dumbest thoughts that actually became a temptation were move to Florida where no one knows you. I don't know why Florida, right? It's so weird. Florida's a nice place. I've been there. Move to Florida, run away from your church, drop it. Move to another country, another city where no one knows you and where you will not hear the noise of why you left. Do it, run, flee, because the higher you rise, the harder you fall. And I'll be honest, sometimes those moments really make you feel weak they make you feel scared and they really take you out of a sane mind and one of the struggles that I've had to face in this entire season with those attacks has been how do I lead well when my mind feels sick how do I lead well when I don't feel so strong how do I speak strongly when I don't feel confident? How do I measure up when I don't feel like I'm fully present because I'm so consumed by worry and fear? And I felt this whole entire season like the enemy of my life was trying to fight me so hard because he knew and he knows that what God is going to do in October, he cannot stop. So one of the things the devil does, one of the things the devil does when he can't stop God, and he knows that he can't take away what God has given you, is that he pushes for you to give it up. And so in this season, what is God asking Marlon Medina, the pastor of Crave Church, to sacrifice? I'll tell you what it is, to remain faithful. When remaining faithful is difficult. This is my fight, personally. 
And I have to sacrifice and show up and preach and smile even though when my heart is crying. This is my fight. When I just want to hide and run, I have to show up and speak and sing and empower and believe and prophesy and preach and have faith and shout and lift my hands and trust God when I can't trust. Listen, you can't trust yourself or your willpower because it'll fail you. This is what God is asking of me. So I stand before you today, not as a perfect pastor, because I never have been and I never will be. And I stand before all of you today as witnesses and declare to you and tell you, I may appear strong at all times, but I'm also a weak man with flaws and imperfections. I also struggle. I have anxious thoughts that sometimes want to drive me away from God's call in my life. I battle so hard sometimes that I feel like I'm in my couch and there's nothing happening on my outside but on my inside. It feels like my mind is about to snap and break. The thoughts come so rapid and so fast that I genuinely feel like my mind is about to like snap. Have you seen like a piece of wood that you snap and it makes that snap sound? That's how sometimes I feel. And I'm like, please, please, God, please, 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 please help me. Please. Because it's scary. It's scary. But God has called us to be an Esther for such a time as this. And we will see people be saved. And we will see Vancouver be transformed. And we will see Crave Church. We will see Crave Church be a church for the nations. We're not staying in Vancouver. We're not just local. We are.